Great. So I, I wanted to spend a little time um, talking about integration today um, in the context of this um, model that we've been exploring called the waves of wakefulness. And here's a little map again of the, the waves. Um, the first five positions are kind of a mapping of the wave itself, uh, a kind of big picture look at what happens on the spiritual journey over, usually over decades. Uh, and then the sixth position in the center, which has all those uh, sort of rotating lines around it, that, that is meant to describe the movement of waves, the continued movement of the waves of wakefulness uh, crashing into our lives. And... Um, so it's not really a position as much as it is the ongoing process of waking up, uh, constant awakening and constant surprise that we talked about last week. And so today I wanted to talk uh, and hone in on the position of integration, number five, that place on the wave where we uh, have crested the wave and come fully down and are on the other side, on the bottom. And in a way, you could say we're, we're, we're back where we started, um, uh, except now we're on the other side. So it's totally different. On the one hand, it's the same. Uh, it's the same place as where we started when we first got into meditation and sp the spiritual life, whatever. And it's totally different because we've been through so much. Um, and I wanted to uh, share this quote from Daniel Ingram, who is, he was my first meditation teacher, and he really focuses a lot on the states and stages of the path. And he has like a very, I'd say, high bar when it comes to meditative achievements and things like that. Um, he claims to be an arhat on the cover of his book, you know, which is a fully enlightened person. Um, so, you know, this is someone who really cares a lot about uh, awakening in the states and stages. Um, uh, and he says this in his book, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, he said, we may be able to attain to astounding states of consciousness and understand the true nature of reality. But what people see is how these abilities and understandings translate into how we live in the world. Um, so even someone, even the person I know who's the most obsessed, I'd say, with enlightenment, <laughs> uh, still uh, recognizes and, and, and points out that it's really how we, how we end up um, integrating those understandings, translating those glimpses and experiences and even ongoing recognitions into our life. Um, this is a quote from Ross uh, Boletaire who's a Zen teacher in New Zealand, and he wrote a really beautiful book called Dong Shan's Five Ranks. And Dong Shan uh, is a Chinese uh, Zen teacher. Tozan uh, Toz is his Japanese name. And Dong Shan um, wrote this really beautiful Zen, cryptic Zen poem uh, called The Five Ranks that uh, describes the path of awakening. It's like a map, but it's a poetic map. Uh, a very Zen map. Um, and in, on that map, and the reason I mention it is because it, this map really has informed the waves of wakefulness model quite a bit, especially the fourth and fifth positions um, coming off of the top of the mountain. To me, uh, Deng Shan's five ranks uh, was there for me as I was coming off of the mountain and provided a, a map to help further explore the territory of waking in this case, waking down. Um, I had really been following a lot of waking up maps, and I, I felt at a certain point that um, that they actually weren't helpful anymore, um, and that I, I felt I knew the territory they were describing, and what I was getting into was not that. I wasn't trying to wake up any further or get any more empty or have any more profound experiences. I was just like dealing with my life <laughs> and the struggles of it and realizing, oh, yeah, this is all empty but it's all still happening, <laughs> you know, it's still occurring. Um, and so uh, Ross uh, in, in this book writes about um, Dong Shan's perspective and his perspective on the process of integration, which is one way of describing Dong Shan's fifth rank and also the name of this fifth position. Uh, another translation is the word concurrence, interestingly. Uh, and, and Ross writes, we can't consciously bring about this integration. 
it only becomes possible with our continued meditation and full-hearted engagement with life and its challenges. That is the integrity of the way, he writes. Um, he also writes here, uh, describing, I think, the process of integration. He says, we forgetting emptiness, that is, letting go of the third position and rolling down the hill, waking down, forgetting emptiness, we face up to hard-nosed particularity and oppositional circumstance, treating them as all there is. Yet, although we avoid taking refuge in emptiness, we nonetheless deepen and mature our experience of emptiness by facing up to the challenges we encounter. And I, I, I love this way of describing the path, the waking down process, because it is so much about letting go uh, of emptiness uh, as some special experience or something special about us. Um, and you could say it's about letting go of the sort of enlightened ego um, that naturally kind of develops around any of our experiences that we have that feel profound and change us. It's like, it's natural to, 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 for the self to, to uh, infuse itself in that. And, you know, for some while we, we feel special or different. Um, and, and I think the same is definitely true of this position, the third position always already, you know, one has become the truly uh, enlightened one <laughs> you know, at the top of the mountain, able to see everything, emptiness in all directions. Uh, and yet um, we can't hang out at the top of the mountain. Uh, we have to come down into our life. And then it's not so much about getting to the top anymore. It's about whatever challenge it is that we're facing in our life. That becomes the path because everything is empty. Life is empty. Uh, then everything is the path everything that comes up and just dealing with normal life's shit is the path to awakening. That's what really invites us to understand more deeply the nature of this empty life. You know, why is it this way? Um, well, I don't know why it's this way, but we still <laughs> we keep getting challenged and uh, it's almost like life uh, just wants <laughs> to open us up, <laughs> you know, just be like, okay, time to get bigger. Uh, yeah. So this is con the continued development of emptiness. Um, in, in integration, it's just, you know, just living. And, you know, when I think of emptiness, I also, what comes to mind is, uh, or rather when I think of integration, what comes to mind is that there are certain things that are needing to be integrated, right? We're integrating something with something, something else. There's at least two things that need to come together for there to be integration. Uh, and when I think of what those things are, uh, I think of this, uh, another phrase that for me could, could also be a synonym for integration, which is um, non-duality. And I was um, hanging out with a, a friend and mentor named David Loy uh, a number of years ago when we, we both lived in Colorado at the time, we're neighbors. And um, he'd written a book, uh, which I'll share here, uh, called Non-Duality. Um, and so I, I had this question about non-duality and I figured he'd be a good person to ask considering he wrote one of the books on it. <laughs> and I said, David, I, I've got this sneaking suspicion. I've got this sense, and I don't know exactly know why, but I have the sense that there are multiple types or kinds of non-duality. Uh, what do you think about that? And he said, yeah, I, I think there are as many kinds of non-duality dualities as there are dualities. So for, mm -hmm. for as many kinds of uh, oppositional poles or seemingly opposite things that you can imagine, um, there are that many non-dualities, experiences where the poles drop and one realizes, oh, I was projecting, transposing this difference into the world and that I can relax seeing things in terms of just this and this and it's much more open and nebulous than that um, it's not really clear uh, that there is just this and just that um, in fact it seems like they're both this and that 
are true. Or you could also say, as Nagarjuna did, neither this nor that is true. Uh, in fact, emptiness is the negation of all of our concepts about what things are and how they are. Um, so that said, when we talk about integration, it is, it is useful to, to, to understand what is it that we're integrating into what. Um, and, and for me, I think there are different poles or different pairs of dualities that can point toward this, many different ones. Um, but some of the ones that I think are probably most relevant or important to what we're doing here uh, are things like the one and the many. That'd be like the Greek, Western Greek version of non-duality. We're integrating the one and the many. Uh, or in Nagarjuna's language, the absolute and the relative. We're bringing together the absolute reality with the relative reality. Um, or in the language of my own teachers, uh, Jack Kornfield and Trudy Goodman, they often talk about bringing together the dimension of the universal with the personal. Uh, or bringing together our Buddha nature and our zip code, you know, our awareness of the specifics of life, like what we need to know. Um, in mathematical terms, for those that are math geeks, and this is something I learned from Shinzen Young, um, we could also look at integrating or bringing together zero and one. Uh, and actually zero, it's interesting, zero uh, was, a, is a, is a, was invented by the Indians. And uh, the actual word for zero in Sanskrit is sunyata, emptiness, <laughs> void. So they discovered their empty void nature, and then they they translated that into numbers, zero, uh, which is really important. <laughs> to have zero opens up all kinds of possibilities, mathematically. And we're integrating, you could say, our zeroness, uh, our shunyata nature, with one, oneness, or with ex thingness, experience, uh, something emerging out of zero. Um, so to me, I think about this integration process. Sometimes I think about it like stitching, uh, and I've never done any stitching, but you know, when I watch people stitch, they're bringing these two things together and, and weaving them into a, a larger fabric. And I, and I think of integration like that sometimes that we're stitching together these two dimensions, you know, we're stitching together our, our Buddha nature with our, you know, the particular things we need to know. We're stitching together our awakening, you know, whatever, uh, awakeness we have available to us uh, with all of our confusions and our delusions <laughs> uh, and we're, 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 we're really working with both our dual nature um, we both have this sort of Buddha nature and uh, and we are still humans um, with all the all the challenges that come with that so um, you know just a reminder <laughs> it's important <laughs> to remember I think um, another way of talking about integration would be uh, to, to look back at some of the early Buddhist teachings, especially the one on uh, what's called codependent origination uh, or dependent origination, praticca samuppada, um, which is this beautiful early Buddhist attempt at describing like how things are the way they are. Um, and, and basically, I think you could translate codependent origination as this arises because of that. It's really, uh, if you look at the early Buddhist um, canon, the Pali canon, a third of the Pali canon is dedicated to what's called the Abhidharma, the higher Dharma. And that is uh, all of this kind of theory that early Buddhists put together to try to describe how and why things are the way they are. Uh, how is it that fear arises? What are the, what's the proximate cause of fear? In order for fear to arise, there has to be X present. And if this, this, and this are present, then this becomes possible or this arises. And they're really, in a way, we're trying to map causality out in terms of one's individual consciousness um, so that we could see, okay, like this is how suffering arises and this is how it, it could be, uh, we could put an end to it. Uh, and in that model, you know, the, the, the key point was to, to notice when our uh, sensations and the, uh, and the charge around those sensations, whether they're pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, uh, to notice the rising of that 
and then to kind of be able to stop there without then clinging or craving something else. <laughs> That's kind of the basic early Buddhist approach to freedom. It's like if you can just notice the sensations and see how they are without like adding anything on top of them, then you're free. Um, in the Mahayana uh, turning of the wheel uh, later on, the understanding of codependent origination seems to me to have changed. And no longer was it just a description of one's internal experience, but also was a kind of description of the way the universe is structured. Um, in philosophical terms, it became a kind of ontology. You know, where it's like the universe is interconnected, is codependently arising. Um, everything is arising because of other things. Um, and here, this understanding of interdependence or interdependent co-arising, as it's sometimes called, um, really starts to point out the interrelationship among uh, beings and things. Um, the interconnection, uh, the interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh describes. Um, and this, for me, is a shift in the perspective of awakening, like what awakening is, uh, what it means to integrate. Um, in the early Buddhist conception, our, the focus is on one's personal suffering and freedom. In this bigger picture of Indra's net, one of the uh, early and one of the Mahayana Buddhist texts that describes the interdependence, how it actually for them looks in, the, in, in reality, um, there are all these nodes that connect and everything is connected and every node, every point of connection reflects the entire network. This is why network theorists get so excited about Indra's net because it seems to be one of the, it's like an early description of networks. Uh, and it's an early description of, of the interconnection of all things. Um, and here in, in that tradition, what's interesting is when, when that interdependence is, is conceived of as being something that happens at every point in the universe, then um, the idea or the concept of emptiness changes. No longer are we talking about there just being no self that is like anything you can experience as an image or a thought or a feeling. Uh, isn't who you are. It's something that's impermanent coming and going, something that when we hold on to causes you know, existential suffering and when it's released leads to freedom. That's the early Buddhist view, right? Of emptiness. Uh, and when we really let go of the self, we can glimpse and we can wake up. You know, we can have this initial glimpse into emptiness. Uh, in the Mahayana tradition, it's different because we're no longer saying there is no self. Uh, instead, we're saying there's no independently existing self. That self doesn't exist independent of anything else in the world. It's a co-arising with, uh, you know, it's like, I mean, let's look at how we're born, right? <laughs> it's like we co-dependently arise with other beings. Uh, you know, the, the whole notion that you, you're born alone and die alone is so silly. It's just not true. <laughs> most people, everyone's born with other people around. And then, you know, most everyone, fortunately, uh, also dies with people around. Uh, and so, yeah, like we, our existence depends on other people's existence and on other things and on the world's existence. Uh, and so the, the other thing that's important about this is that compassion becomes a central value in this, in this way of looking at things um, because we're not, uh, we're not in this alone in a, in a very true sense. That's where you get the bodhisattva vow. You know, I'm going to help everyone awaken because if I don't, if, if everyone's not awake, then how can I say I'm awake if we are all in this together, truly? Um, and so you see these things like universal compassion, the bodhisattva vow start to, to really become important with this reconfiguration, re reconceptualization around what emptiness is and what awakening is and what the whole point is. Um, last thing I want to say about integration um, is uh, by way of a story um, I, I was hanging out and teaching alongside uh, Michael Taft who's uh, I'm wearing his, <laughs> his podcast t-shirt today uh, deconstructing yourself and 
we were in California at the time. Um, this was last fall. And uh, we were at this event exploring the interface between meditation, psychedelics, and technology. Um, uh, San Francisco is obviously a great place to do that. And um, part of what he ended up talking about is, is, is a kind of idea that's popular in, in this sort of weird cultural space of folks interested in both consciousness and, and technology, which is the idea of um, the enlightenment button. So if you've heard of the enlightenment button, this is a, a theoretical button. <laughs> doesn't yet exist that I'm aware of <laughs> unless Shinzen, Shinzen's discovered it. I'm just not telling anybody. <laughs> um, but the idea is you, you, you press this button and then whoever's you know, using the enlightenment machine uh, on the other end has a complete and full experience of enlightenment. Um, and whatever that is, I'm not sure exactly <laughs> what's meant there, but, uh, the enlightenment button is just a way of considering what if we could just suddenly be awake. And here, I think what people mostly mean is what if we could be at the top of the wave just all of a sudden by pushing a button. And what uh, Michael said uh, about the enlightenment button is he said, I would be much more impressed or interested in an integration button than an enlightenment button. Cause that's actually the much harder thing. <laughs> <laughs> from, you know, from his point of view and, and also from mine, you know, is how to take whatever glimpses uh, of wakefulness we, we, we have or we've had or are having and integrate them into our life to translate them, as Daniel said, uh, to translate those into how, into how we live in the world. Um, so, and I don't, I don't, I'm not so hopeful that that's going to be possible to create an integration button. I think that's, as Ross Bolletier points out, that's, that's, that's what happens with our continued meditation and full hearted engagement with life. Uh, you know, it's something that's kind of gradual and organic, um, this process of integration. <laughs>